And she said as she talked to me, the pain has killed my heart. The pain has killed my heart. But I, don't, I will talk a lot about tragedy and healing, but I also want to sort of winnow this speech with humor. And the other thing that happened, as you might imagine, is a sort of Nebraska bumbler like myself spending time with people from so many different cultures, there was a lot of humor. A lot of very funny things happened. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those. One of them has to do with language. And because everybody is, is struggling to learn English and saying things in awkward ways, there's a lot of little glitches and misunderstandings, some of which are, are, are more embarrassing than others. One of my most embarrassing ones is this. I was talking to a mother of a Middle Eastern adolescent daughter, and this daughter was celebrating her freedom in our country by wearing, instead of a, a heavy black curtain, as she called it, a sort of a, a skimpy top. And it was for a 4th of July celebration. Uh, the mother and daughter were in our backyard actually looking at my flowers. And the mother started pointing at her daughter's breasts and saying to me, beautiful, beautiful. And I thought, hmm, what should I say? I don't really know <laughs> how to respond to that. This isn't something that would ever come up in America. It didn't, it just, it didn't seem to me like there was a, a right way to respond. But um, I did what I learned to do with refugees when I didn't know what was going on and felt uneasy, which was just do nothing. Just stand there, let a little more time unfurl, and something will become clear eventually. Well, eventually it turned out what, what the mother was saying was the fabric of the daughter's tank top was beautiful. It was from Iraq. And so then I could say, yes, the fabric is very beautiful. I agree. Another time, this is sort of an example of <clears throat> gender in all countries trumps culture in a certain way. Jim and I, one of the things my husband and I got into was doing a lot of delivering furniture and books and food and clothes to different people. And one time we were taking a couch to a, a, a Goodwill Center where refugees picked up furniture for their apartments. It was a pretty heavy couch and as we drove our Chevy van into the, the parking lot, I said to Jim, go in and ask a guy to come out and help you with this couch because I think it's too heavy for you and me. So Jim goes in, he asks if there's a man there who can help. It turns out the only man there is a Laotian man that's about four feet three inches tall, weighs about 80 pounds, and of course is half my size. And so he comes out, he looks really kind of weak also, and I immediately see the situation, offer, please let me help with the couch. But he, like an American man, says, no, us men will do the couch. And so I sat and watched as these two guys did that. What happened with me writing this book is my whole idea of what it means to be human expanded. If before I wrote this book, I knew this about the human race, after I wrote this book, I knew this. It was a very enlarging book for me. I learned what humans will do to each other and for each other in ways I had never understood before. I have a friend, Bill Holm, who went to China and wrote a book called Coming Home Crazy. And one of the points he made in that book was he doesn't know how much he learned about China living there, but he learned a great deal about America. And I had the same experience. I didn't learn a great deal about 52 cultures. I'm not an expert on any of the places um, that, I, that I studied a little bit as I got to know the refugees. But I learned a great deal about our country and how it works and how other people see us. For example, in Lincoln, I'd never spent much time in factories. I, I didn't even know where they were. And, and I've spent a lot of time in factories because refugees, when they come into Lincoln, they do what I call 3D work, the difficult, dangerous, dirty work. A lot of times they're exploited. They're brought in to do work nobody else will do. They have no choice. They're desperate. They're given work that, that no human being should be expected to do. But as with everything about refugees, it's more complicated than that. There's always another side. For example, um, we, uh, Jim took a, a Sudanese man, a lost, he was, the, the term is lost boys of Kakuma. I don't like it, it seems a little bit patronizing to me. But he was an orphan from Kakuma. He'd never worked, and 
Jim was taking him up for his first day at a hospital as a janitor. And Joseph is this man's name. He was so scared. He was very, very quiet. He was shaking all the way in the car to the hospital. And Jim was going to go in with him, introduce him to his supervisor, make sure that the, the beginning of that day got started well. And Jim was saying later, he was thinking, boy, I hope it's a good supervisor, because if the person is rude to Joseph or treats him badly, he's so scared he's likely to just pass out from anxiety.